If Henrik Ibsen was the founder of the realism movement, then the Moscow Art Theater in Russia is where it was perfected. Founded in 1898 by Konstantin Stanislavsky and Vladimir Novorovich Danchenko, the Moscow Art Theater would become the most influential of late 19th century theaters and perhaps one of the most important theaters of all time. Almost an experimental theater when it began, the Moscow Art Theater was one of the first to dedicate itself completely to realism. The plays they did there and the acting style they invented would provide the foundation for virtually all forms of modern theater. They would permanently change the way plays were staged and how actors perfected their craft. The responsibility for the Moscow Art Theater's success can generally be laid at the feet of two specific people. The first was this man, playwright Anton Chekhov. Though Anton Chekhov was a doctor by trade and by education, he had begun writing short stories during his time in college, and while practicing medicine, he kept up writing, and after his first book sold incredibly well, he gradually started to move away from the practice of medicine and focused on writing as a career. Chekhov kind of created his own style of writing based on things like objectivity, originality. It was very different from mainstream Russian literature, which was very analytical. Chekhov used much more subtle means to tell his stories and to create his characters. He would describe his original style as an objective manner of writing, meaning that he tried to avoid stereotyping and instructive political messages in favor of what he considered cool comic irony. So Chekhov plays are significant not just as wonderful examples of realism, but also as perfect examples of what we would call a modern-day tragic comedy. Now, this is a play where both tragic and comedic elements are blended to create a more realistic tone and a more realistic feel. In his plays, the comedies don't provide a contrast, but rather they increase our awareness of tragic circumstances. If you have ever heard the expression that comedy comes from pain, that is a good way to summarize the work of Anton Chekhov. In one of his plays, you may laugh at a character's misfortune, but what the play then has you do is examine what brought them to that low end. A good example is in the play The Seagull, one of the running jokes is that the main character of Constantine constantly tries to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head and missing. So, of course, the joke is that he's put the gun to his head and missed. But this serves to increase the awareness of this character's sadness and tragedy that he has tried on multiple occasions to commit suicide. The great tragedy of his plays is that his characters are unable to fulfill their deepest desires. In the four most famous Chekhov plays, the characters all have a burning desire, something that they want more than anything else. And though they may struggle and though they may try, they can never truly achieve those goals, either because of outside interference or just due to a lack of of desire to actually see the transition through. Chekhov wrote dozens of short stories and one-act plays, but he is best remembered for his four full-length tragedies. The Three Sisters, The Cherry Orchard, Uncle Vanya, and The Seagull. The Seagull being the first major hit of the Moscow Art Theater and the one that ushered in the era of realism. 
The second man responsible for the rise of realism and the success of the Moscow Arts Theater was its founder, Konstantin Stanislavski. Stanislavski was a director who was one of the first to direct the works of Anton Chekhov. Now, one of the interesting things that you have to understand is Anton Chekhov, while writing his four most famous works, believed that he was writing comedies. The tragic comedy element did not come along until Konstantin Stanislavski got a hold of the scripts. He is the one who told Anton Chekhov, these plays are not comedies. They are tragedies with comic elements. So right off the bat, it takes a lot of guts to tell the playwright to their face they have no idea what their plays are about. Using the plays of Anton Chekhov, Stanislavski developed a new style of acting now known as the Stanislavski Method. This method would become the groundwork for just about every acting theory that has come down the pike in the last hundred or so years. Every actor who is trained today is trained in some variation of the Stanislavski method. One of the first things that Stanislavski introduced was that the actor had to do a great deal of script analysis. Up until this point in acting, an actor would basically get the script, memorize their lines, and say, my character is mad here, they're sad here, they're happy here, and just project those huge emotions out to the crowd. Stanislavski said that's not good enough, and that an actor must read the script over and over and over again and discover the background of the character. They need to understand who the character is, why they make the choices that they make, that the performer must be aware of the character's background, their environment, their relationships, to provide the proper context for a performance. It was not good enough in Stanislavski's mind that an actor present an emotion, an actor had to actually feel the emotion. One of the basic tenets of the Stanislavski method is that the actor had to become the character. Before this, characters were put on like a costume and taken off. But Stanislavski wanted actors to get into the minds of the characters and make them real people. The Stanislavski method is very complex and contains many different elements, but what we're going to do just for the purposes of our conversation is focus on three of the main principles of his acting method. The first is called the magic if. According to Stanislavski, this is the most important question that an actor can ask themselves. He puts it to the actor to ask the question, what would I do if I were that character in that specific situation? Now, with a script, you already know what the character is going to do and what choices they are going to make. But by asking yourself, what would I do, and putting yourself in the character's place, the goal was to try to understand the character's train of thought, how they get to that conclusion, why they go left instead of right. The second element that we are going to discuss is known as the super objective or the spine of the play. From an acting perspective, this is asking what is the character's overall goal throughout the entirety of the show. Stanislavski says that an actor has to know what the character's super objective is, meaning what are they trying to accomplish by the end of the play? What do they want in all of the world? That's the super objective. The objectives are what the character does in every scene that they are in that helps them achieve the overall goal. 
So you're in one scene and you say, my goal here is to do this because getting this is going to help me get that. Lastly, and probably most infamously, Stanislavski is responsible for developing a form of actor training which is called emotional recall or effective memory. Again, the goal being to make the performance as realistic as possible and to make the characters as human as possible, as relatable as possible, and to get the actor into the mind, body, and soul of the character. Emotional recall is when a performer is called on to remember an event in their own life that parallels the situation that is going on in the play. So, for example, if you are doing a play wherein your character's father dies, then Stanislavski's emotional recall would ask you to think back into your past when you lost a parent or you lost a pet or you lost someone important and remember what that felt like and then recreate that emotion on stage. Alrighty, I want to take a second here and talk to you a little bit more about emotional recall because it's probably the most famous of Stanislavski's theories and it's the one that has led to some unforeseen issues. Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is probably one of the most groundbreaking ideas to come out of theatrical theory in a very long time. Asking the actors to use their own emotions, their own history as a baseline in order to make their portrayal on stage more real to them, it's, it's revolutionary. Again, you have to remember that up until this point, up until the time Stanislavski got his hands on the work of Anton Chekhov, acting was very presentational. It was very big. The actors just bellowed their lines and they felt horrible emotions. Oh, I'm so sad. They showed you what they were feeling, but they never actually felt it. Now... Via Stanislavski's method and emotional recall specifically, actors are connecting to their emotions and connecting to their characters in ways that had never been done before. And it opened up an entire new world of performance. Audiences were being moved by shows in ways they had never been moved before. And acting teachers for decades later would take the work of Stanislavski, specifically emotional recall, and they would twist it and they would turn it and they would ratchet it up and make it more intense and keep wanting the actor to get more intense, dig deeper, give me more, give me more, give me more, and the actor does and the actor does and they give you this great thing and they pull up this horrible memory from their past and they're showing it on stage and they're breaking down and they are crying and they really feel it and the audience is really connecting with them and the curtain comes down and the actor doesn't know how to shut it off. Emotional recall is a fantastic theory, but it has also proven to be very dangerous. Many actors have suffered nervous and emotional breakdowns because they have trudged up all of this negative energy. Keep in mind, you very rarely hear about emotional recall being used to promote a happy emotion. You know, remember that time that you were so happy as a child? No, it always wants you to find the worst in your life. And when you ask an actor, especially given the fact, and I say this with all love, I say this being an actor myself, that in a lot of cases, actors are not the most emotionally or mentally stable people on the planet. And you ask those people to drudge up every bad thing that has ever happened to them and then turn the volume up on it. 
And what you are going to find is a lot of people breaking under the strain. And there are some famous cases of actors who suffered horrible mental breakdowns because they were not using this method properly. Even Stanislavski cautioned against its continuous use. Said it was a one or two time thing. Don't make it the entire cornerstone of your acting philosophy. But a lot of actors did. Probably most famously Marilyn Monroe was a student of a variation of the Stanislavski method. She was a student of an acting teacher by the name of Lee Strasberg, who was very heavily influenced by the Stanislavski method and the emotional recall. And her almost obsessive desire to delve into those emotions and make the emotions she played on stage real led to a very real breakdown. So emotional recall is a phenomenal step forward in the world of acting, but unless you know how to do it and unless you know how to get out of it once it's started, it can prove to be a very dangerous one. Thank you.